All right. Thanks, everyone, for coming. I know it's kind of a late afternoon, so uh, great to see you all here. Uh, my name is Martin Lanner. I'm with SwiftStack. Uh, we do Swift, obviously. And um, I'm going to be talking about monitoring and analytics using uh, ElkStack, Elasticsearch, Logstash, and Kibana. I'm assuming this works. Maybe not. There we go. Okay, so here's my little agenda. This is what we're going to be talking about. So why would you want to do this? Uh, who would want this data? Uh, I'm going to look a little bit at the components uh, that I have deployed and um, talk about the setup configuration, um, a little bit about the grok patterns that I have created for this. Um, there were none that I could find uh, originally, so uh, they're brand new. Um, going to do a little bit of a, uh, a walkthrough live demo um, on uh, my my VMs on my laptop, and then we're going to look a little bit at the visualizations and the dashboards that uh, Kibana provides. All right, so why is the question? Uh, I work at SwiftStack as a an engagement manager manager, which means I hit work a lot with our customers. I deploy Swift for them. And we have multi mach multiple machines, and uh, we need to get the logs into a place where we can help them troubleshoot, understand what's going on, uh, all kinds of things. So uh, typically, you have your logs. They're all dumped onto the same machine. And when you have tens, maybe hundreds of machines, it's kind of hard to troubleshoot anything because you need to get the logs from everywhere. So to a lot of people that are running Swift, it's like this. It's just a big black box. They don't know what, what it is and uh, what's there. So, um, you know, everyone knows that, you know, the internet and Swift in particular, it's all intended to store cat photos. And since we're in Tokyo, it's got to be a Hello Kitty. Um, all right. So, in my daily job, I also have a bunch of people that work with me in our support and professional services organization. And we have to support these systems, and it's challenging, like I said. We have to understand what is happening, where and when. We need to be able to troubleshoot the systems faster. Um, but we also want to know what the cluster is being used for. You know, who's doing what, when, where. Um, and there's a lot of data but there's not a whole lot of information. So with the data coming in from the logs, uh, I can turn that into information that's actionable and in, in different ways. Um, so providing easy access to that. And then when we see something going wrong, um, whatever it may be, we can proactively start taking actions uh, if needed. So then the question becomes, who actually wants this data? Um, I would argue that uh, the devs want the data because they can better understand if there's a bug, something that needs to be fixed. Ops absolutely needs to look at it all the time to understand how to better manage their, their clusters. Uh, support people uh, obviously want it as well. And ultimately, business people probably want the data also because you want to understand, for example, like what is your... Uh, Workloads look like. Workloads are critical to being able to put the, the, the data out there and making the, the applications run well and serving customers, whether they're internal or external. So with that said, the components here is OpenStack Swift, uh, Elasticsearch, Kibana, and Logstash. Most of what we'll be doing here will be kind of focused on the Logstash piece. Um, there's a lot of work that's gone, that I've gone into trying to do that. And uh, then we'll look, th look at that through Kibana and uh, the Elasticsearch stuff. So here's the Elkstack. Um, the only other thing I've added in here is Nginx, which is just adds a, a web front end for Kibana. Then I have the Swift node. And uh, I have a single Swift node that I've used in this example. That Swift node is running proxy account container and object. Uh, so all four main services on a single box. 
of course, in reality, you'd have much more than that, but uh, it's a lot of VMs to run on a single laptop for demo and something, so. All right, so hopefully you can see this. Um, Elasticsearch runs on port 92 or 9200, Logstash on 5000, Kibana on port 55601, and Nginx in this case on port 80. Um, and I have, on the Swift cluster side, I have Logstash forwarder installed to send the data into um, the ALK environment. All right, so we have a couple of key configurations here. Um, the key configurations really come down to, I think, the confd filters for Logstash on the server. Um, Grok patterns, um, I'm not sure how familiar everyone is with them, but they're basically a regular based on regular expressions. And um, if you know anything about regular expressions, that can be kind of tricky. Um, so, um, like I mentioned earlier, I went out and I kind of scoured the internet to see if anyone's done anything before with actually parsing the Swift logs for EC indexing on the Elasticsearch side. Didn't find anything, so um, I went ahead and started creating Grok patterns for, for those logs specifically. Um, and generally speaking, Swift comes with two, two logs. The, it's the proxy access log, which has the proxy stuff in it, and then it has the storage pieces, which is account container and object, and all the replicator auditors and stuff like that. Um, and again, Logstash forwarder is installed on the node, and it includes, in this particular example, just the syslog and information and the Swift stuff. In, in real life, you'd probably uh, include a lot more than that, but um, that would be really confusing and too much data for this demo, so. All right, some Elk server configs. Uh, you can see here, I basically have uh, broken it out into three different things. You have the lumberjack input.conf, you have the filters, and you have the lumberjack output. The one that I'm gonna be focusing on is the filters part, and I based all of this on the Swift logs. So this is available on the, um, on the web. So if you just go to uh, the OpenStack docs for Swift, it's there. And you can see the client IP, remote adder, date time, request method, so on and so forth. And these are all very actionable pieces of information that you can use to get really good information about what's going on. So here's the example. Um, there's, this is the Grok pattern for uh, the proxy access log. And I'm sure a lot of you guys are probably pretty savvy with this. And uh, later on, I put this up in a GitHub repo that's public. So if you want to help contribute to it, play around with it, you can go download it and check it out. Um, in addition to this, uh, the Swift logs have a few little chain, d different ways it does uh, timestamps. So I created some extra patterns for that just to adjust for, for those pieces. And you can see the extra patterns, Swift, which I called it. Um, they're pretty simple, but they're there. All right, so the Swift node configs. Um, hopefully you can see this, it's kind of small maybe, but uh, it's okay. Um, this is this, the simple output um, that you saw before, the filter. And uh, specifically, if you look at um, the piece that says var log swift, and then you have the asterisk.log in there. And then I have put, uh, under the fields, I've added a, s a type called swift uh, to be able to easily uh, put those, um, that into a field in the, in the um, interface so that we can search for it. And I've also specifically named it swift.example.com and um, that's just my cluster name, so you can call that whatever you want. All right, so let's dive a little bit into the demo here and I'll show you what's going on. All right, so um, this has been running for about half an hour, an hour or so. 
this is just a standard uh, thing. I created a little bit of a, uh, I selected some fields here, the cluster, so that I can search for the particular cluster. So if I have more clusters than one, I can run all these different clusters into the same uh, instance and search across them. Uh, I included the host field up top here so that I can see where the data is coming from. I call this uh, Swift Stack node one. And I also show which log um, each message is coming from. If you want to drive down into, dive down into this a little bit, you can see here that um, you can see all the different pieces. So I, I showed you the log from um, the log definition from the OpenStack Swift page earlier, which is actually this right here. But you can see all these different pieces. So you see the host uh, field, you see headers, you see the file, you see a date time stamp, you see the cluster, client IP, there's none in this case, but uh, here you see byte sent and the full message and a bunch of other information like request time and so on. All right, so let's go and pick uh, the, uh, just the proxy log. Uh, so here you can see the different proxy logs. And if I wanted to search for uh, Hello Kitty. Oh, no, I don't get any anything on there, unfortunately. Let's see. Oops. Huh, okay. Let's upload something. All right, and upload goes on. All right, there you see. Now you can see that there's a whole kitty image in there and we can see a transaction record specifically for that. So I can search the, if I wanted to, for example, look at that particular transaction record. I can look at these other log entries I've done um, and I can look for transaction record. And you can see how that, that shows up here. So all the entries that has that same transaction log will show up. So why is that important? Um, well, there are times when people say that, um, you know, I lost data. So, so far I've never seen Swift ever lose, da lose data, but I have a transaction record of everything that goes on in the cluster. So if I know that Hello Kitty image was in there, I can search for it, I can find a delete record for it, I can find the transaction record, and I can track it all the way through and see everything that it did. I can see what disk it lef left or was on, or which disks actually it was on, and I can see what IP address deleted that item. So it's incredibly powerful to be able to do so. And we at SwiftStack have had to do this for some customers at times when they said, oh, we lost data, and we've actually been able to go through, find the data, and say, well, you know, this IP address actually deleted the data. So uh, it's not like we lost the data. Someone did it intentionally. Um, so there's a bunch of visualizations you can create here. Um, here's one example. Uh, hopefully you can see this, but this example is um, for different status codes. And so you can see what kind of status codes are being generated by the system. And uh, most of these are 200 OKs, which seems like a good thing. Um, and then we have some other things here, like created, 204 null content, so on and so forth. Um, so I've created a bunch of visualizations here. You can refresh them as well. And you can open new ones. We can look at different ones that I have here. Now, these different visualizations, they can be really powerful. You can create whatever you want. You just have to kind of dream up your, your 
what you're looking for and what's important. You can put it up on a dashboard. So I created a couple of simple dashboards here. And right before I walked in here, I started dragging and dropping a bunch of information in, deleting some data, uploading some data. And, and some of these uh, are just, here's a CRUD profile. It just lists the puts and gets and deletes and posts. Um, here's the request methods, the same way, but it's broken out into sort of percentages instead. Here are some user agent data. And I'm not sure if you can see this. It's a little hard to see, maybe. It's maybe better like that. Um, user agent data could be really important. Um, if you've ever used Swift, you might have come across something called Python Swift Client. Um, in this particular case, uh, it's hard to see here, but uh, I'm using Swift Client 2.6.0. And um, a lot of people may use different Swift clients. So the question is, well, why don't they upgrade to the latest? It may have new things, new features. Maybe we want to actually push them to upgrade to the latest. And so by looking at this, I can go out and I can find out what people are using. Are they using the C++ libraries? Are they using Java libraries? Go, uh, the Python Swift client. And it gives you a lot of good information in terms of what you want to do with the cluster. Who's using it? How are they using it? Uh, and so on. Other things, request times per second. Also pretty, inf pretty informative data. You can see how long does it take to upload things. If you start having problems in the cluster, that request time may go up. Um, and, but you can sort of baseline that and understand what, how the cluster is doing based on looking at the request data, the time ranges. The status codes one we looked at before. Um, here's a, another one, pie chart that I created for upload object object uploads in bytes. Uh, so you can see what's, what's the size of all the different objects. You can create another one that shows the distribution uh, specifically. And that may be important because if you have, let's say, a, an application that renders really small mapping images, for example, you may actually want to have a cluster that is built on a particular set of hardware. If you, on the other hand, are using the cluster as a as a, uh, say, a backup target or a um, archival thing. It may be a, a different set of hardware that you want or need for that. And then you can customize your, your cluster based on that. And that may have implications on how much money do you pay for, for various pieces in this cluster. So that's pretty much it there for that. We'll go back to the presentation. And let's see here, there we go. All right, so uh, I created a couple of to-dos here for myself and also maybe to inspire other people to, to take a look at this and understand how it works. Um, some of these grok patterns I created, uh, they can be refined for sure. Um, you can also make additional grok patterns to understand things like what does the the replication cycles look like in the cluster. How, how, much, how fast are they? Uh, do you need to do, uh, take actions uh, in terms of making sure that your replication cycles are faster and that you get any, have any kind of problems? Um, so, for example, one thing that, that would be nice uh, to do would be to separate out replication and auditor log files to have more fine-grained information about that. Um, like I kind of highlighted before, there's a million different ways of looking at data. Depends on who it is. You make make different dashboards for for different types of people. Ops people may want to see something, while devs may want to see something completely different, or devs might not even care. They just want to search through the logs. Um, ultimately, what I'd like to do is to actually push these grok patterns up to to Logstash, uh, get them in the Logstash distribution so that when you install it, it comes pre-configured and ready to go. All you need to do is start it, point your logs at it, and you'll be done. Um, so I created a Git repo yesterday. It's available. It's under the Swift Stack account. Uh, it's called Swift to Elk. And if you want to take a look at it, deploy it. Uh, it's there. 
uh, I need to put a little bit more information in and how to actually deploy it, but it's pretty straightforward. Um, and, and that's pretty much it for my presentation. If you have any questions about what I did, how I went about it, um, if you want me to demo anything else, we can play around with the, with the actual demo. It's live and it's up and running. We can unmount disks and do things like that. But anyone? Thank you. This is very helpful. So I have one question. So if you have a um, multi-region cluster, Swift cluster, mm -hmm. what's your recommendation for this ELK setup? How does it should look like? That's a good question. Um, so obviously, you would, if you have multi-regions, you'd have uh, probably have one uh, ELK server on one side, and then you may not have another one unless you build it in a cluster, which was a little bit beyond the scope of what I was trying to achieve here. But Right, so uh, if you you say you have one ELK server on both each side? Yeah, because I don't, in case there's one side, right, I still want to have the, I don't want to lose that. I don't want to lose the ELK, right? Right, so if you, if you, you need want... need to be a distributed solution. Yeah, you can build a distributed ELK server if you want, Logstash. Um, I did not really look into that, to be honest, at this point. But you can point, if you wanted to, you could point your, uh, your so say, data center A to one side and data center B to the other side. Uh, but ultimately, you would have to have to combine, if you want all the data in one place, you'd have to combine it into a single, point it to a single log stash in, uh, instance. Have you ever considered to have two separate ELK and then using, I think Elasticsearch has some capability, kind of like, uh, what is it called? Uh, something like, uh, uh, I forgot the name. Basically, it can route, you know, kind of like mix two uh, uh, elastic search cluster in one view uh, or versus I you can I do I one I because you I have, have latency it, problem yes. <laughs> yeah, their latency problem right yeah uh, I have thought of it but I didn't really look into it and how to do it okay thank you but if you have any suggestion for it I'd happily take them okay. any other questions yes So Martin, um, have you thought about add the log analysis, like uh, event uh, correlation, if you have the latency surge, and then what is the root cause of it? So now, when I looked at this, it's mainly you do the search or you do the dashboard display. The root cause analysis part is pretty much uh, manual, right? Have you thought about it to push it to the next level, to right. something like that? Yeah, that's a good good question too. Uh, so there there are some uh, tools out there that you can connect to uh, Logstash and Elasticsearch, and you can alert on it, and you can learn more and more, right? And as as you see things coming in in the logs and having potential issues, you can start alerting on them ahead of time so that you know when something's coming up. And but beyond that, uh, sort of. That's once you see that and you start learning about it, I would, I think that's something that the developers would really be interested in, in knowing. Like, okay, seeing what those patterns are and and understanding how that, how that works. Yeah, I think uh, the problem we have right now, the other type of the storage is that when I have the client impact, let's say you know the latency is high, it's paying the bud to find the root cause of it could be some disk is dying or something on the, the network. So, but you know, the debugging process is really a piece of art, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right? So. Yeah, the, tr for sure it is. It's, it's hard, but I think with things like, for example, the latency or the uh, time to completion that I showed uh, earlier, right, in the, in the examples, when, if you see those going up into, uh, abnormal levels, uh, though that would be, that's where you really need to start looking into the logs. And and uh, if, if you see an, a, a disk unmounted in there, I didn't actually show an example of that, but uh, that's something where if you start losing disks rapidly, that can obviously be a problem in terms of how the cluster needs to replicate on the back end because it's going to have to take data 
from other parts of the cluster and move it out to create a third replica of that data. And uh, that is something that you can also see. And, and when once you have, if you unmount a disk, you will see a high amount of replication activity in the logs. And so you can make you can make aggregations on that and see how the the you can correlate it to you know to a disk failure or you can correlate it up to like well suddenly I have a huge influx of data right uh, in the cluster so it could be different kinds of reasons for why that would happen but uh, if you if you aggregate all that data and it, then you can definitely see what's going on and why it's happening so. Any other questions? All right, well, I will be hanging around here for a few more minutes if anyone wants to talk afterwards or take a look at what I have running. And thank you very much.